What's up, you guys? Today I have with me Dr. Norma Edwards. Dr. Norma Edwards is a founder of Reprogram Your Life. She's a certified NLP life coach, and she's the author of the book, Awakening. Norma, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm happy, happy, happy to be here today. Glad you're happy. I'm happy too. So all right, we'll get right into it, Norma. So if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself, like what your life was like before this major event happened. And then please, of course, share with us your life-changing near-death experience. Well, I was born in Guyana, South America, raised there, and got married. And my husband and I uh, made the trip to London so that we can pursue education. So I was living in London, um, very, very, very much fully indoctrinated in the Christian religion. That is how I was raised. And um, I was there and... My husband started school first. I took with me to England my oldest son. And he was a baby when I did. And so I was uh, more or less at home taking care of the baby and adjusting to winter in in London. Winter in London is is really hard. Snow, four feet of snow, etc. And I woke up one morning and um, I was not feeling well, Just, just not feeling well. I think at that time I had just started working at the British Railways Board. And I got up and did the normal morning routine, but feeling uncomfortable, not so much in pain, but uncomfortable. And then I got to work and I'm there until four o'clock. And I began to realize that during the course of the day, I had this excruciating pain that was intensified. And at four o'clock, I ask whether I could leave, you see. And so I get into the elevator. And in the elevator, there was only one other person. And that turned out to be also a life-changing situation for me. She was Hindu. And I knew she was Hindu because she had on her Hindu robes and the dot on the forehead of the head. And um, two of us were riding the elevator and then excruciating pain hit me and I collapsed. So when the, 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 the door opened and she was pretty, pretty, um, she was a pretty smart young woman, the hospital, St. Bartholomew's Hospital, was only blocks away. So instead of calling an ambulance, she got people to help her and they got me into a cab. And the cab got me to the hospital. Now, in all of the confusion, the cab driver drove away with my handbag. He brought it back the next day with everything intact. But all my, my, my documents, my driver's license, all that was in my handbag, you see. So by the time we get into the emergency room, they're asking her, what's her name? I don't know. <laughs> you know, she knew nothing about me. And so she stayed the entire night, something that, that I always valued. You know, she stayed the entire night. night. They took a picture of me and called the cops and had the cops tried to find out who I was. And then I was rushed into surgery, excruciating pain. I passed out at one point. And um, one minute I'm in great pain. The next minute I am really, really calm. I don't understand it. But I'm on the ceiling and I'm looking down on my body on an operating table and doctors and nurses around me. Now, it's it's kind of interesting, you know, you would think when you get out of body, your processing system slows down. No, it doesn't. It seemed to me like I was even more immensely aware of my surroundings. So now I'm really, really confused. How could I be in two places at the same time? Because I'm looking, them working, looking at them working on my body, and I'm trying to scream at them, I have no pain, I'm in perfect peace, There's no need for them to continue this operation, you see. But I realized nobody can hear me. So then I think the thought came to me, how do I get off of this ceiling? And this is something that I teach now, the power of our thinking. No sooner I thought that I was on the floor. And I'm running from one doctor to the other going, hello, hello, this is me. I'm okay now. I don't understand what. Nobody can hear me. 
So then the thought occurred to me that, you know, women are more intuitive than men. <laughs> so maybe if I try the nurses, I might get a better, I may get a better response. So I'm running from nurse to nurse. And again, nobody can see me. And the next thing I know is I flatline. And I knew I flatlined because I had family who were nurses. And I'm looking at the graph, you see. And the thought occurred to me, but wait a minute. <laughs> if that graph indicates that I'm dead, I can't be dead because I'm thinking, I'm processing, I'm understanding what the doctors and nurses are saying to each other. I'm really, really confused. Then the thought hit me, um, the equipment must be malfunctioning. <laughs> and with that, I thought, well, I had better get out of here before they take my life by accident. And with that, I found myself going through the ceiling, straight up through the ceiling and into an extremely dark tunnel. What was strange about the darkness of the tunnel was that I was not afraid at all. There was no fear. And I entered this deeply, deeply dark tunnel and I'm moving at something like the speed of light. I'm moving really, really, really fast. And I come around the bend and when I come around the bend, I could see the exit to the tunnel. And at first it was like a kaleidoscope of amazingly beautiful light. But the closer I got to the exit, the light became crystal clear white light. And so I remembered thinking again, I'm processing. I remembered thinking, if I survive this, the intensity of that light will probably damage my eyes. And then I merged. And when I merged, there are no words in any language to really describe the joy, the love, the beauty, the excellence of where I found myself. Absolutely pure love. And I realized that I had somehow become love. Couldn't explain it, but I had the sense that I had now merged with love and in merging with love, I had become love. So then I began to think, um, well, well, what does one do in this new environment, you see? And as soon as I asked the question, I'm moving again. And I moved very swiftly to a screen. Now, in 19, this happened in 1966. In 1966, we didn't know anything about huge television screens. Television screens were really small. Well, this was a huge television screen. And I stopped in front of it, and it um, divided itself into three columns. The first column on the left um, was the column that showed me my life as I had planned it. And for the very first time, I am looking at the fact that um, I planned my life. In the next column now, it's divided now into section, my life as I had lived it. At that time, I was 26 years of age. And I'm looking at my life as I had lived it. And I'm confused. Because what I'm seeing on the left-hand side, what I should have lived, doesn't really correlate to how I live my life. So I'm now confused. It was not judgmental at all. It was just confusion. And then in the third column, in the third column is as though someone had created a stamp and the stamp said, objective not accomplished. And now I'm looking at the, this, the middle column, because it's now scrolling, you see. And it is showing me my life from like birth to 12, 12 to 20. You see what I'm doing? 26. And I can see now and, and literally feel the energy and the experiences that I've had in those periods of my life. And again, I'm amazed. As a matter of fact, I'm amused. It wasn't really judgmental at all. And my amusement came from the fact, how could I not have known that there were deeper objectives to my life than the ones that I lived out? Because in, in each after each line, you come to the right-hand side again, there was that stamp, 
Objective not accomplished. Objective not accomplished. And now I'm really feeling stupid. <laughs> like, how could I have lived for 26 years and not recognize that I had not even attempted attempt to accomplish what I had set for myself? So the screen comes to an end and um, it clears. And when it clears, I was a child. I've always been one with questions. And during my childhood, I had a lot of questions. It seemed like every Sunday we went to church, on the way home, I had a question or two about the sermon. And eventually my mother said to me, you see, when we go to church, I want you to close your eyes. Don't even look at pastor because you're asking questions he cannot answer. But this one question I had that nobody seemed to answer for me was, Christ came and he said, I came so you can have life and have it more abundantly. And that question popped up in my mind. And as soon as that question popped up in my mind, the screen in front of me, I found myself traveling again very quickly. And a new screen appeared before me, which was even bigger than the one before. And now it's lit up and it begins to scroll. And now I am looking at six past lives that has been dropped into the one I just left. To help me, first of all, to understand the enormity of what it is I had planned, and the fact that I had definitely not fulfilled any of those plans. Now, it's much, much later that I understood that I was at the Akashic Record. The Akashic Record is the place where there's a record of everything that has happened in any universe. And when you are there, you're not just viewing the information, you're re-experiencing the situations. And so now I am looking at six lives that I've kind of like jumped into the life that I had just left, which gives me an understanding of why I had set the goals that I had set, you see. And then I couldn't, I'm baffled, well, why didn't I stick with it? You know, and, and of course it had a lot to do with the, um, I guess the religious way in which I was brought up. It was really quite truthfully in, in the depths of, of religion and dogma, one doesn't ask questions, just one just listens and one accepts, you see. And that was like very clear to me. So now I'm looking at these six past life experiences. And um, they're very interesting because I, I can feel, I can feel the energy. And the very first one is like I am in um in the old, old, old ages, when it seemed like the, the earth was in darkness. And um, people lived in caves. And we walked around with torches. And um, I'm in this cave with other women. And uh, there is war going on, this tribal war going on. And they've taken us, the, a number of us, women and children, to this cave for protection. And then they, lead, they led us out of the cave and onto the seashore. And there were a number of small boats there. And they began to pile us into these boats with the intention that since it seemed like my tribe was losing the war, they wanted to protect the women and the children. And they began to load us into, into these boats. I ended up in a boat with 23 other women and 10 children. And they pushed the boat out to sea. And it capsized. So I re-experienced the fear, the fear of what took place on that boat, especially when it capsized and we were all in the ocean and we all drowned. That was the very first one. And um, then I moved to the next lifetime where I was a male and I was a warrior. And in those days, it was knives, you see, and, and, and um, they didn't have guns in those days. That was a war. I was a man, and I was a warrior. And again, feeling all that 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 the emotions of war and and killing and 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 striving to survive. That was the next um, experience. The third experience that I had was was very interesting. Um, it was 
during the time when in the Bible, it talks about Moses in the bulrushes. I was one of the women on the, on the sidelines when Moses was taken out to the bulrushes. And part of the discussion as to what we would do and um, the fear that we had rescued, you know, someone whose heritage, et cetera, was not going to be accepted in our community. So again, intense fear. But then, of course, as women, knowing that we're not, we're not going to let him die, you see. But there was this tremendous fear in, in the decision that was made. Then um, from there, I move now. And as you can see, I'm moving up in history. From there now, I am, uh, I'm at the place where Paul, Paul is, is struck off of the horse. And um, he becomes... He becomes uh, dumb. Can I speak to that here? And and I'm there, and I'm I'm there with all this this emotion again, all this this emotion you see, and feeling the persecution that Paul had put upon upon Christians, and that point at which he he was redeemed, and that was very tearful. There was a lot of tears there. Then I found myself at the foot of the cross, screaming, crucify him. Like most of the, most of the, you know, other people who were there. And again, that was, it was a lot of trauma because you're experiencing the energy and the, and the, and the thinking. And, and I think it has a lot to do with helping me to understand that what we experience, we carry with us for a long time from generation to generation. But then the next, the next clip was me and my mother. I am now a black child. My mother is black. I know who my father is because he is in the field, but nobody can know that he's my father. It's a big secret. And we're picking cotton. And I could hear the hoofs of the horse of the master man as he is in the the um the row the row behind us you see so i know sooner or later he will get to our room and when he does and i can hear the crack of the whip on the backs of those who cannot meet their coat and i know when he gets to me I will feel that whip on my back because I'm a child and I can't meet the quota, you see. So I'm trembling with fear as I hear the horse's feet, the horse's hoofs come around the corner. And instantly the scene changed. And now I'm a white man on the horse working that whip. I am now the master man working the whip, different lifetime. But that's where it moved from there to that. And um, that created a tremendous amount of turmoil in my thinking, you know. we two different places, and I'm looking at it at the same time. And I'm experiencing, you know, the energy of, 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 of the whip on the backs of the, of the slaves. And then feeling the... The, the anger and frustration of the master man that will, what's most important on his mind is meeting that quota. And then the screen kind of, um, it, 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 it closed. And I'm standing there wondering, well, taking in my surroundings. I know a lot of people say they went to heaven, but I don't, I don't say it is that I went to heaven because nobody told me it was heaven. And then I moved very, very swiftly again. I'm moving very, very swiftly. My feet is not touching the ground. But now I'm moving in that light. You see that that period that I was at the Akashic record, I'm feeling all the pain, et cetera, that you would feel on the earthly plane. But when I start moving again, now I'm back into that beautiful eternal white light, which seemed to have now wiped all that energy away. And now I am dropped at a um, stream, beautiful stream. And 
You know, there's that hymn that we as Christians sing, yes, we will gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river. Well, that's where I was taken. I was taken to the beauty of that river. And on the other side of the banks, there were 300 and odd souls who are either family members or friends from many lifetimes who now lived on the other side and they were there to welcome. And um, I could feel the love. I could feel the amazing love that they projected at me. And um, I started, just, I stepped into the stream. And my aunt, because at the time, both my parents were still alive. My aunt, who was the most recent family member to have crossed over to the other side, she stepped into the, to the river and she begins to walk towards me. And I've got all this anticipation of love when we, we kind of get together and, and we hug. And, and up until then, I think I knew my aunt loved me. But I had no idea she loved me as much as she did. I could see the love. I could see the light and light of love around her. And I could feel it exuding to me. She's coming towards me with her hands outstretched. And the others on the uh, behind her have got all their hands stretched like this. And from their hands, I could see this beautiful light. And I could feel the love coming from their heart. And just as she got close enough to me, she stopped and she said, I'm so sorry, but they're sending you back. And I said, why? And she said, well, it's not your time. You have to go back. And I said, well, I don't want to go back. And she says, well, I'm sorry, but you don't have a choice. And um, I was very upset by that. Extremely upset. I did not want to return because it was such beautiful love and light and and even even the water we were wading in the water but even the water feel to exude this love in a way that, that you can't really describe on this side and she says well no i'm sorry they're sending you back and they're sending you back with a message so i said well excuse me there are millions of people back there Surely they can find someone back there and give them the message. Mm -hmm. And she says, no, no, it doesn't work that way. They're sending you back with a message. And the message is, there is more to life than meets the eye. Life is eternal. And with that, I found myself falling, 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 and literally rammed into my body. Leaving the body was quite exciting. Being put back into the body was not. Excruciating pain. I move from love to excruciating pain because, you know, our energy fields are huge. And to experience that huge energy field being crammed very hurriedly into this tiny body, it, it was not at all a good experience. Um, so now I'm back in my body and I am in... I'm in a little room, you know, they've done the operation. As a matter of fact, what they discovered was I was carrying a baby. It had died inside of me and had begun to poison my body. So they had to go and take it out. So now they have me in a, in a recovery room and there are two nurses sitting at a table and they are, um, I guess they're watching my recovery, you know. But the two nurses, they were female nurses, apparently belong to the same church. And on Sunday, because my near experience happened on a Monday, and on Sunday, one went to church and the other one had to work. So the one that went to church is now summarizing the sermon for the other one, you see. And in summarizing it, you're talking about, you know, if, you, if you're not, you, you, you haven't kind of aligned yourself with Christ, you know, you are going to, and all of a sudden now, I'm like, wait a minute. Where did they get such an idea? There is no hell. <laughs> but I've got tubes in my, my throat, you see, so I can't speak. I'm outraged, but I can't get the words out. So when she's finished narrating the sermon, summarizing the sermon now, she turns on a little radio that was on the table. And it was on a classical station. And this music started to emerge. And I'm lying there. And I could see the notes. 
Every note has a very specific color. Every color is attached to a number. Every number has a frequency. And I'm watching how they're inhaling, inhaling this energy and taking it in. And you can imagine, I'm like, wait a minute, what happened to me? How come I could see the notes in the music? You see, once the music, once, once I could observe the music and kind of analyze it now, I don't understand why. I'm looking at one of these nurses and I'm thinking, she's here observing to observe me in observation of me. And she has no idea she has cancer because I could see in her body and I could see the cancer in the body. You see what I'm saying? And now I'm really, really baffled. Where did all of this come from? Then two male, um, it looks as though they, they had a white coat. I'm not sure whether they were doctors or whatever. They came along and stopped to talk with the two nurses. And again, I could see them breathing in this energy from the music. Uh, and it was really, really, really very fascinating. Um, when I went on, I got out of ICU, now, and they put me in a ward. Because, you know, in those days, they put you in a ward with my eight or ten beds. And... Um, I guess up until then, I hadn't gotten a lot of sleep. So I was looking forward to getting some sleep. And there was this patient who was just crying out because she thought she was going to die, you see. And she's she's crying out for her mother and she's crying out to God. And, uh, and, and it was kind of like irritating to me. So eventually I pushed myself up and I said, lady, stop. You have 10 more years to live. <laughs> Would you stop keeping us awake? For no reason at all, because for some reason I could see she had 10 more years to live. That this, whatever it is she was experiencing, was not going to be the cause of her leaving the planet. Now, the day I left the hospital was very interesting. It was winter. The trees had no leaves because we're in London. But as soon as I stepped to the door... I could see the energy in the trunks of the trees. There's energy that is moving from the earth all the way up to the top to keep that trunk alive. And there's energy that is moving from the top of the trunk all the way down to the ground. And I'm standing there, I'm fascinating. I, how come I can see all this? How come I can understand it and relate to it? Because before the near-death experience, that was not part of my my understanding, you see. So now I am I'm, I'm in a world where I am very conscious. I'm conscious of the phenomenal energy that the earth holds and the fact that we wear leather shoes, which keeps the energy from penetrating. And I'm thinking, oh my God, the world would be a better place if you know we, we did not walk around in these leather shoes, something about leather that it doesn't allow the beautiful energy, and the journey back to normal life began, which was very, very difficult to adjust to. Mm. And so I became very depressed. Uh, I was depressed for three years and attempted to take my life. First time I, I um, drank stuff that did nothing except make me puke. Mm. And then, of course, I'm, I'm I'm depressed now because oh my god, I can't even kill myself. Mm. <laughs> the second the second attempt was very interesting. So I, I would get up in the morning and go walking, and I noticed that there was this ten ton truck that was parked at a certain spot. And every morning, you know, the British are. They, they, they live with a certain discipline. You do things at a certain time. And every morning I noticed the driver got into the truck. He turned it on. I will walk past and come back before he pulls it off, you see. And so I got it into my head. Well, that would be my pathway back to the other side. And so I planned it very carefully, right? Timed it all the way down to how long it would take him to drive and get to the speed he needs to get to. <laughs> and I um, practice it for a couple of mornings. And um, that particular fatal morning, I got up and was convinced that before the day was over, I would be on the other side. And I don't know how he did it. I suspect he 
can't understand how he did it. But he pulled that truck up within inches of my feet. And of course, Peter came running around and I'm shaking my hand at this man, you know. I'm screaming at him, I'm shaking my hand. And everybody thinks I'm shaking my hand at him because he almost killed me. I'm shaking my hand at him that he failed to do what <laughs> I expected him to do. <laughs> Uh, and then um, they hauled me back to the spirit realm. They took me up to the spirit realm. They took me, I think it was in the ninth dimension. And I was muted. I couldn't speak. I was there to listen. And they told me that if I made another attempt, um, they would have to allow me to die. But that they will slam me back as a baby into another body with fully loaded senses. And if I thought <laughs> that life without fully loaded senses was bad, I would really experience, you know, something that is not nice to be experienced. Um, that woke me up for a little while. And then I tried the last time I tried those pills. And, and that was very interesting, you know. And I share this because people need to understand that everything that happens to us, most of it is predestinated. And if it's not your time, it's not your time. You're not going to go. If it's your time, there's not too much you can do about it. I, I skillfully got a friend of mine to talk about. She worked in an emergency room, and I got her to talk about these people who come in there. And she would say, well, you know, if, if only the took time to research how much pills they need to take, then <laughs> she would not have to overstay her time in the emergency room to take care of. And I took the time and I gathered the amount I needed. And my son by that time was five. And I, you know, we women, we're really strange. I cleaned the house. You mean you're going to die? Why are you cleaning the house? I cleaned the house, I bathed my son, put clean clothes on him and sent him outside to play. And I got him to the bathroom with a glass of water in one hand and the pills in the other. And I'm saying the last prayer, I think, and my son comes running into the bathroom and he goes, mommy, 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 look what I found. And when he opened his hand, he has a caterpillar, this half butterfly and half caterpillar. And the voice in my head said, and who is going to explain the mysteries of life to him when you're gone? And so I turned my hand over, dropped the pills in the commode. I made a commitment right there and then that whatever it takes in terms of discipline, etc., I was going to find my way back to the other side, to the glory of the other side. And that journey began. Soon after that, um, I was asked to be in bed at 8 o'clock every night. And between 8 and 11, they would download information. And then I'd open my eyes and I would, I would write down as much of it as I can remember. And that went on for three years. During that time, um, I got pregnant and I was carrying my son. And I asked whether they would allow me to see how he put his life together. And they took me up to the 10th dimension. And I was able to watch the soul of my baby put his life together. We do. We know. See, when we are in spirit, we know everything. We, we are fully aware. Um, and it's kind of interesting in that process of, 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 of creating, putting together a lifetime. You literally see where the soul decides what will be put into the supra consciousness level. Because at that level, it's not getting out of there while you're on this, this planet. You see? And I watched him put his life together. And then God blessed me to watch my son at 40 years of age. I watched him live the life with the plan, and it was not easy. It wasn't an easy life. So that's the story of my near death experience. And um, for 15 years, I did not speak about it. It was, to me, it was too sacred. Yeah. And it wasn't until my mother was 
making her transition and I was her caretaker. At one night, because my mother was died in the blood of Jesus Christ and you couldn't move her from yeah. there. Yeah. And she was transitioning. I know she was leaving. And my father had come and told me she was leaving. And I started to talk about my near-death experience for the very first time. And at one point, she was so quiet. I said, do you want me to stop? And she says, no, keep going, keep going. And I shared it for the very first time. And the next day, she was so energized by it because she was dying of cancer and needed help to even get out of the bed. And she got out of the bed and she said to my brother who was sitting there, she says, may I have the pleasure of this dance? And she had a piece of music that she really enjoyed. And, and, she, and my, she and my brother danced. And the next day, she died very peacefully. And I think that is when I realized that sharing the experience can bring some comfort for those who are crossing over. And that's when I began to talk about it. Wow. That's wow. the story of my new day experience. Wow. A lot, changed a my life, changed yeah. my life profoundly. Definitely, definitely. And I'm glad you didn't succeed in those attempts on your life, you know. <laughs> There's a lot of things we could talk about, Norma. Um, wow, really appreciate you sharing all those things. You know, let me start off by asking about like, because I know this was kind of like a big thing in your, your experience was that those three columns of screens that you saw of your life going on, right? Mm -hmm. When it comes to the objective, or objectives that you were supposed to accomplish was it was it something like one main thing that you missed or was it like several particular it was things a series, that you missed? it was a series of things because you see it's a build up okay i mean i finally lived my purpose i got to know my purpose and i lived my purpose and my purpose was to go into prisons but when i got ordained i said to them i don't want to run a church I want to rescue the perishing care for the dying. And so I went into prisons for 27 years and worked with uh, men and women in prisons who were getting ready to transition into the community. And I was given a, the concept of reprogram your life, which helped them to change their life. I, I use music because one of the things I saw on the other side that music is not just for entertainment, but it has different pieces of music have different frequencies and those frequencies can impact our own frequencies and lift the frequencies higher, you see. So I finally uncovered my, my life's purpose and was able to live it out and therefore brought um, a tremendous peace. I mean, for 27 years, I went into prisons, I worked from nine to nine. But I never called it work. And I never felt I was going to work. I was going to, there to help people change their lives, you see. So when you're looking at the, the review, you are seeing, um, for example, if I look at the number of not just jobs, but careers that I had before I entered the prison. I can see where I learn leadership skills. I can see where I learn how to be a listener. I can see, you see what I'm saying? So all of that has to be put in place before you get to where it is that you're supposed to fulfill the destiny. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, I mean, I guess in the second column where I guess you kind of missed, missed the opportunity, so to speak. I mean, so in that sense, were you saying that you, that objective wasn't as clear to you at that time? You were just kind of, developing those characteristics about yourself or something in the future, but you still didn't know what you wanted or what your calling was? Or was it? Oh, I didn't. I didn't. Okay. I didn't. And, and you know, it's interesting. I had, a, um, by the time I got to America, I had a job working for lawyers. And it's funny, that was one of the only jobs that I really considered was a job. It was getting to work in the morning. I was like, I need some help. You all got to help help me here. I did not like it at all. But guess what? I spent three years working for lawyers. Had I not done that, I wouldn't have survived working in the prison. There you go. Because it gave me an opportunity. Like when you get into prisons, of course, everybody will tell you they, 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 they're not guilty. And that's true for some, but not for all. See what I'm saying? But having worked for three years with lawyers, 
gave me what it what it is that I needed to be able to have compassion and be able to survive. Right. So when when in when looking at the um when looking at my review and I saw objective not accomplished, that for example was something I should have learned early in my twenties. Got it. See yeah. what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. But I didn't because I was bu- I was busy thinking like the world is a, as a husband and wife. We got to build wealth, man. We got to, you know, <laughs> we got to go after money. Everything was, you know, the, the 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 curtains have to match the 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 rug on the floor. The, those that's the place where my my attention was. See, it was not on attention on the attention was not on the spiritual aspects of life at all. So finally, you know, accomplishing that purpose in your life. When how was your first day of working in the prisons? How did that oh experience God. go for you? The very at first, I have to tell you how I got there. Okay. Because when I came back, I could relate everything that I saw, but I knew that I had been told what my purpose was. But for some reason, it made me forget it. So for years, I'm going around. Like, what is my purpose? What is my? I know it was told to me. How come I can't remember it? And then one day, I'm in the United States of America, and I'm driving, and the voice in my head said, fine, I'm on the beltway. Find a a good spot and park. Well, by now, I've learned to pay attention. So I get off the beltway, find a spot, I park the car. I turn the engine off, and I said, okay, what is is it you want to say? And the only word that dropped into my head was prison. And I'm in prison. Am I going to do something wrong and get arrested? <laughs> I have three sons, or I'm one of my sons. Got... <laughs> I screamed at them like, I can't, "If you're trying to get me to do it, I can't do it. I'm afraid of guns, and I'm afraid of, <laughs> I'm afraid of handcuffs." I drove all of the gas in the car out. The car stalled in the middle of the road because I'd driven out all the gas, screaming at God or His spirits, so whoever can hear me, that I can't do this. You see. And then I went to my pastor at the time and I'm telling her this. And I said, I feel like God is asking me to go into prisons. I can't do that. And she says, well, are you finished? And I said, yeah. She says, well, I get the sense. He's not asking. The only thing he's asking you to do is show up. And maybe when you show up, you will discover why you're there. That was even more frightening, you see. But then if you read my book, it's a whole series of circumstances that got me. Because getting into a prison, if you have not committed a crime, is one of the hardest things in the world. Because they always think that perhaps you got a family member in there, (laughs) and that's why you want to volunteer, you see. But it was a whole series of circumstances. But the very first day, I came out of, of the, you know, they walked me through cell block. And I came out of it and I, I can't do this because the cursing on, on cell block, you know, by the time I'm, I'm, I'm living or I'm trying to live a very spiritual life. Oh my God, the cursing and the abuse and the, I, I was like, I can't, I can't do this. And then of course I, I, I went into a 40 day fast and I went to God and I say, if, if this is what you want me to do, you are. I'm traumatized just thinking of it. By the time I retired, that's where I retired from, 27 years. Um, I remember one day I came in and and the security guard said, you want it in the superintendent's office. Well, I was always breaking rules, you know, always. I thought, oh, God, what rule did I break now? <sighs> My dad, and he said, close the door. He said, you know, as soon as you get, you pull that car on this on this um, campus, I know you're here. I said, really? But your, your, your office doesn't look out on the parking lot. He said, no, I know you're here. He says, call all the cursing stops. The cursing stops. Once that, he says, I said, well, how do they know? He says, oh, they have ways, you know. They may have one who is cleaning offices and then they pass that to the person in the laundry. He said, but the minute you pull your car on, on, on this compound, the, the behavior and the cursing stops. He says, and that goes for the, the guys you're working with and the guys you're not working with because the guys you're working with will not tolerate the others cursing while you're here. 
So, you know, I've got this thing about the universe takes care of fools and babies. <laughs> <laughs> it was an adventure. Which lives transform right before my eyes. And some of them I'm still in contact with 20, 25 years later. Awesome. And I just speaking of like, you know, our life's journeys, and you're speaking about the several past lives that you've had, right? I mean, those are pretty wild stories. Like, I'll just ask a question that I know are probably on some people's minds. Like, why can't we remember all of our past lives? We get in the way. Think about this. If you were a professor of mathematics in a past life, and here you find yourself in college now, um, and you professor teaching mathematics can't tell you anything, you're not going to listen. <laughs> <laughs> you see what I'm saying? <laughs> you are in a past life, um, an emperor. But in this life, you choose to be a homeless person. That information is not going to help you. Because you choose to be a homeless person because there's something about that experience that is going to shape your world vision. See what I'm saying? So if you can remember that you were an emperor with all this money, et cetera, we we'll get in the way. Would that, would that also explain just the whole idea of, you know, because there are certain people who have certain abilities or even you having, if I remember like an interview that you did, you have this issue with swimming, right? I mean, because oh, you had yeah. a previous life of drowning. So can that explain like the phobia, the unexplained phobias and the unexplained yeah. giftings and abilities that people have? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Because you see, you wrote it into the plan. You wrote it into the plan that, well, okay, I'm going, I won't remember I was an emperor, but I will remember the leadership skills. I'll remember the leadership skills. So you'll find yourself now in, 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 in modern day America, and you find that you can communicate to people. You can get them, you know, motivate them, et cetera, et cetera. That's because you allowed that part of your past life to transfer into this one because it had a purpose. It has a purpose. But if you remember it all, we won't get too much accomplished while we're here. Won't be able to learn a lot of things. Mm -hmm. If I could kind of um, unpack that a little bit more, because I know pre-birth planning it's kind of, uh, it could be somewhat even of a, a controversial topic for some people, because like, for instance, you were mentioning about how in, in that one lifetime, you were the young black girl, right? Picking the cotton who got hurt and then, or you were fearful, right? Of, of, of the white man. And then in another life, you were a white, a white man, right? Mm -hmm. Doing the whipping and stuff. And so mm -hmm. I've heard a lot of these kinds of, you know, ideas and um, experiences that people have had through past life regression and so on, where the one abused becomes the abuser or, you know, something like that. So how should we respond to the negative people in our lives? Like if I were to take this on a practical level, right? Because there are people in our lives that could be very toxic, very abusive. And I think sometimes when people hear this for the first time, because I know I've had many conversations about this with people, they are uncomfortable with it because it makes it seem like we can justify the actions of the evil so-called evil people that are doing these horrible things you know um, what would you say to that first of all that's because we're processing out of the world standards that question brings me to the word forgiveness would you believe me if i told you that when we plan a lifetime we literally, or sometimes, approach people who have been very near and dear to us and who where is love, tremendous love between the two souls. And we'll approach them and say, you know, I've been trying to learn X, Y, Z for the past five lifetimes and I've failed. When I get there, would you be the devil's advocate in my life, please? Can you feel that? And then we get here. And I wish people had the ability because now I travel. I can travel to different dimensions. And every now and again, you would see two souls embrace. 
Oh, you did a wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So the thing about evil and good is not as simple as we try to make it so in our everyday life. I mean, that, that could be a tough one, though, so, for a lot of people to swallow, right? Especially for things that mm-hmm. I think to a lot of people, certain actions can clearly be seen as evil, right? Like trafficking or, you know, sexual abuse or things like that. I mean, so I, I, I hear that concept a lot of like someone who was once your friend and, you know, their best friend in one life, they become your enemy to help teach you a lesson. Is that something that... No, they're just doing you service. See, when you understand... You asked, you requested that because it's probably the only way that you will learn what it is you're aiming to learn. So I say to people, when you ask for forgiveness, ask ask first for forgiveness for yourself. Forgive me and forgive. Because I may very well have been the one who asked them to do it. Should there be see, consequences? We take this lifetime as though it's it's the beginning and the end all. It isn't. It's the longest, look at it this way, it's the longest period of time you're going to spend in a college. Coming to earth is going to school. Pack your bags mentally and spiritually, and you descend into a body, and you're in school for 50 years or 80 years. And when you leave, you go to the record to determine whether or not you learned or you mastered the goals that you set. And if you did not master all the goals, you have to bring forward the three or four that you missed and add it to the next 10 that you're going to set yourself. This is the reason why some people have such such, um, difficult lifetimes. And other people, they may have accomplished 90% 90% of their goals in other lifetimes, and they're only coming back for 10%. And these are the ones who really can come back and, and enjoy the life and what have you because they've, they've only got a minimum amount of, of um, requirements. Earth is a school. And I wish I can reach out and turn on the deep, deep vision that we as human beings have. And you will... When you went to college and you sat in that classroom and there were 20 students there, there were 20 students embodied, but there were probably 20 spirits there as well. They're there to learn just the same as you. Let's talk about the Akashic Records because I know that was a big part of your your journey. Um, You were describing a lot of it as like screens, right? Mm -hmm. Um, What did it look like anything else? Because I've heard it in other ways of it described like like a library. But was your version? Like it is a library. It's a library, but you see these screens that are okay. pertinent to your own. At first, it's like rows and rows and rows and rows and rows. What I saw, rows and rows and rows of, of, of three ring binders. They were all white. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But then it, it, it burst out. It faded out into whatever screen I needed to. Was it something that you watched like like from a a distance or you're in the scene? I'm in the scene. I'm looking at myself. It's like it's like how we you you know, if you if you were in a play or you're in a movie and you can sit and watch how you how well you did or how well you didn't do as part of the movie. Yes, and that's how I was looking at it. But when I first engaged it, it was like walking into this vast hallway. And there are just rows and rows and rows and rows and rows of, of um, shelves. They were all, if I remember, they were all white three ring binders. And then it's kind of like faded. And as it faded out now, it's like the screen comes up and what it is they wanted me to the review came up on the screen. Can you describe like what the planning looks like? So when you were saying that you saw your son planning out, like what does that look like? What, like what does that mean? Oh my God, it's like this huge, huge square. And he's he's pulling stuff from. It's like if you, you know when you're in college or, or even in high school, they may ask you to put together a collage. Uh-huh. It's like putting together a collage. But what was very interesting is the very first thing that we put in place on that collage is our date of birth and our date of death. That's the first two things that goes on there. 
And then it's, it's very intricate, of course. Then the next thing we have to do is identify parents. And parents will be identified based on what it is you're coming here to learn. So you may be coming to learn extreme love. You want to have some loving parents. You might have had 10 lifetimes of loving parents. And now you want to experience, because we have to experience everything that we have to experience. Now you want to experience, like for example, I was, um, I was talking to somebody in a class that I was doing on spirituality. And she was complaining, you know, that her mother was not like a very loving, loving person at all. And um, for some reason, every now and again, you know, when I'm talking to people, the universe will allow me to see flashes of that, of that, um, that collage that you put together. That you right? When I said to her, I said, "Sweetheart, um, you needed someone who had the capacity to carry your genes, because your genes were very high frequency, and the first three attempts failed." Because the person could not handle the frequency. So eventually you had to settle for the frequency rather than the love and put the love in somewhere else. I so need to these, be Yeah, so when these people are planning or when you saw your son planning his life, was there anyone with him? A guide. We all have a main guide assigned to us, you know. When we are on the other side and when the time comes now for the next trip, they tip you tap you on the shoulder. It's time. For me, it took a number of guides to convince me I didn't want to. I didn't want to take that. Yeah. Can yeah. you describe what the, the guide looked like for us? What you saw? It's when you're on the other side, it's energy, you see. It's energy. It's not necessarily a handsome young man or or <laughs> it's energy. It's energy. And you're relating energy to energy, you see. Now they have the ability that they can manifest themselves when they kind of want to on our realm um you know get into a body and manifest that body but for the for, on the other side it's energy i appreciate how you were sharing about the part where you saw uh, the apostle paul and then did you say jesus too did you did you say that or at the cross right because i never heard you yeah. say that in i never yeah. heard you say that in the other interviews so that, that was new for me to hear you know there's so much every time i do an interview something else pops up <laughs> Right, Continue. right, another best life. Yeah. Oh no, that's cool. And, um, that's pretty wild. And while I was embodied now, while I was embodied now, um worshiping the Episcopal Church, and it was Good Friday, and I was on my knees. And um we had a, a, a baritone saying, Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh my God. And immediately I just moved out of my body and I was back at the record. Oh wow. I could see myself screaming, crucified. Hmm. And when I opened my eyes, I was in so much tears that the this, this, this service ended and everybody kind of crowded around me because, you know, they couldn't understand why I was just crying uncontrollably. Yeah. So obviously you're having these interesting experiences happen to you. So after the NDE experience NDE. and, you know, you had your senses heightened where you're able to see music notes. And if I remember your other interviews, like light bulbs would break around you. Oh God, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure your husband <laughs> didn't appreciate that in the house. <laughs> you know, um, I mean, is that like we bought light bulbs by the two dozen. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, do, do things still happen? Like, you know, happen no, on occasion no, or that. after a while, you know, you learn to say, you know, we're on this planet here and um, we can't, can you do something about that? And, and they <laughs> Yeah. What about the notes? Are you still able to see notes? Oh, uh, yes. Okay. As a okay. matter of fact, I work with people now. Yeah, right, with the music, right? In, with music, particularly people who are attempting to recover from, from drugs and alcohol. Wow. Yeah. They use music because music is a language that speaks directly to the soul. Definitely. Do you still identify yourself as a Christian? Because I know you grew up that way. So now that you've had this experience... How do you yes, do I your, do. Yes, I do. And I'll tell you why I do. Because I saw when I put the life together, I, I determined that the cross and the cup will be the symbols that will cover me. 
You see what I'm saying? Now, the doctrine is a different story. And, and quite frankly, I, I still worship in church because I realize that uh, maybe I shouldn't say this. And, uh, <laughs> you know, they are like kindergartners. You can't blame a kindergartner for not uh, being able to solve a mathematical problem, can you? Because they haven't been taken to that level yet. You see what I'm saying? The church is still functioning as if they're in recruitment mode. You know, the apostles had to uh, be in recruitment mode. And the thing that people understood very well at that time was fear. Right. And you use fear to get people into the church. Well, those days are gone. Those days are gone. But um, yes, I still identify myself as a Christian. But I call myself a spiritualized Christian. So I know as, as a spiritualized Christian, have in a, you know, I was really touched just hearing the story about your Hindu friend who stayed with you in the hospital. I know you guys um, kind of, you know, kept it on a down low, like, you know, your beliefs. Well, the, that, inter but... the interesting thing is she came every day to the hospital to see me. Yeah, that was amazing. And we developed a friendship. And when I left the hospital, she was there and we agreed that we would not talk about religion. Because if we talked about religion, it would get in the way. So for years, we didn't talk about religion at all until one day, we're in the park with the children, and she said to me, let's talk about grace. And I said, well, grace is religion. And she says, yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Did you eventually tell her your, about your near-death experience? Oh, yes. Oh, you did? Okay. How did she respond to that? Well, you know, she was Hindu. So they're more likely to accept that that's real but you know you couldn't say to christian people <laughs> you know, it took 15 uh, years for me to say to christian people you, see? you yeah. couldn't say to christian people especially back in the day too so but yes i was uh, afraid yeah, yeah. i was afraid they were going to put me away no i don't blame you especially back in the day when not everyone really talked about that or even had that kind of terminology back then. Well, first of all, I didn't even have a name for what I experienced. Exactly. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, I was married to my first husband then. It led to a divorce because he just could not understand. His thing was, they must have given me the wrong medication or something. Mm. That Because every now and again, something will come out of my mouth. You see that that, that he, he was... He was and eventually, I was mortally afraid that he would have me put away. Well, you're not crazy. <laughs> oh, I know that now. But, but you know for, that a now. While, <laughs> for a while there, you know, I had some doubts. <laughs> no, I appreciate all those, like, just a variety of different experiences that you've had and that you're still having, you know. As we come to an end, Norma, you know, with this interview, you know, is there any message or advice you want to just close off and share with our viewers? Any words of encouragement you want to give? There is always hope. There is always hope. And when they pulled me up to, to the, the ninth level to talk about this obsession I had with, with suicide, I was reminded, I was given this. Love is divine. God is love. And love, when it hits the density of the earth, turns into light. And light is the steward of creation and the recreation. So if you don't like what your life looks like, you have the hope that it can be recreated. You see what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. I see what and you're that's saying. the hope that I, I try to leave with the world. It's not Imagine hope. That. And I do believe that when you look at the numbers of near-death experiencers who are coming forward today, each of us came back with a heightened level of light energy. And each of us came back with a job, some kind of a job, a description that we have to do to spread, to spread the light. You see, I don't see myself as changing the world. That's not my job. That, that's above my pay. <laughs> <That's> above. <laughs> I see myself as being and living as a being of light. And that people who see it will probably ask some questions and probably be interested in me helping them to get to that place. But I am not the one. It's the, it's the source that created everything in all, on all the planets, you know, 
you've been you've been a pastor i've been a pastor you know one of the things that that i try to help people to understand is that everything and all the planets etc was made by the energy of love and light we have come to we live on this planet and everybody has got a name so we give the universal source a name but it matters not whether we call him god we call him allah we call him the divine we call him a rock it really doesn't matter it's just a phenomenal highly energized field of energy that has created everything on all the planets and you know in, in different doctrines we, we give it a different name but you can't run away from the fact that if you look at a tree i sit on my back porch and i look at a tree that has a label on it that says it's 400 years old and and i still can't get over it especially at it, at this time when the leaves are shedding and i'm like you mean to tell me for 400 years you've been shedding leaves and you stay here that's the wonder of what it is that we serve a highly highly energized and a very very high frequency that has the ability and you would know the story of turning itself into a, a burning bush if it wants to So can you see how we limit ourselves when we think it's just a man? You have been very 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 good in asking just the right questions. I thank you for that. Appreciate you sharing your answers too and based upon your experiences which is the most powerful way to give an answer instead of just theory, That's right. right? So That's you're you're speaking And I find that experience. a lot of people are living a reading. Yeah. Um I sometimes do classes. I've got one that's coming to an end now. And um I help people to understand that we have to live the experience. Reading it is fine, but after we finish reading it, we got to put the book aside and give some time to allow the environment to bring us the experiences to come to know that but to just read the book put it away and then pick up the next one is is not is not necessarily the answer exactly exactly and i'm sure you could relate you know just like me growing up as a christian we're so fixated on like what do you believe what do you believe and you know do you hold to this doctrine or that doctrine and that has its place you know beliefs but my question is what do you really know and i think having these experiences that you've had has really solidified yes. where it's more than just a belief Right, but now oh, you know no. these things, right? And I so call I it appreciate. Movie. Yeah, and you know, you were even asking me, you know, who's who's interested in these types of stories? Many people are, Irma, mm -hmm. and um, I'm grateful that you're one of the the people out there who's spreading the message and being the light, <laughs> helping to. You instill just have hope. to be. You know, I feel like I just have to be. It's like I, I, I. Yes, I attend the church, and I am very, very clear. I'm not there to even make them change their way of thinking. You know they 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 they're they're doing their devotions etc. and at the level that they can, but I'm being there. I'm being there to bring the light I brought back with me, and that light will do its work. Norma, right, what's next for you? You got any more books coming out or? Speaking? Yes, I'm working on the second book. Yeah, I'm working what's the what's second the second book? book? The second book is answers to a lot of questions. That like the stuff been. we were talking about today? Yes. There are a lot of people who have a lot of questions. And I have I have selected like 10 or so of those questions and looked at what is the divinity behind it. Because even something as simple as prayer, we come to earth so we can learn the lesson of being co-creator with Almighty God. So at some point in time, we have to stop going to Almighty God like we're beggars. Can't be a co-creator if I'm on my knees begging. See what I'm saying? So just a simple thing is prayer, teaching prayer. You know? Good. No, I'm glad. Yeah, so you'll start to reframe it differently for people who probably misunderstood it through their particular right. lens. Very good. I look, right. I look forward to that. Let me know when it's out. <laughs> Maybe you could come on again. There you go. So what, what, what's the best way people can reach you online, Norma? What's your website? My website is www.. 
Awakening, and there's a hyphen series.com. Awakening series.com. And then your book. And is then on... I have a I have um that's the book. Okay. Awakening series is the book. Okay. And my other website is www.reprogramyourlife.org. Reprogramyourlife.org. And Reprogram that is your, your, your coaching, your coaching yes, that's website. That's okay. Right. Because you're also a coach. Very cool. I am coach. coach. And spiritualized Christian. There you go. (laughs) Right? That's that's right. We'll we'll have those links in the show notes, Norma. So, you know, people will be able to see that. So, you know, I just want to thank you for just sharing your amazing experiences. You've had so many of them, and I'm sure you'll continue to have more and the insights that you're giving. And I'm sure a lot of people will be able to take this to heart and be encouraged and be inspired to not give up. You know, I like on how, Let's hope. yeah, I love on how like authentic and raw you were just sharing your struggles and how you attempted, you know, several times to end it because life was so hard and just, there's just a lot of things going on, but you didn't give up. And I think that could be very inspiring for the listeners today. And I just want to say thank you. And I appreciate what you're doing. Easy to not giving up comes from having experienced the light. I have a slogan that I have that I give to people to put on their refrigerator. It says, God is in charge and all is well. And for some people, if they can't handle the word God, the universe is in charge and all is well. Because that 40-year-old tree, this 400-year-old tree, just simply moves me. I sit there and I look at it. My God, you've been shedding leaves and recreating leaves for 400 years and you're still here. Who sustains you? See what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. There you go. But thank you so much. You've been a great, great, great um, inspiration in pulling out information out of this, <laughs> which I never talked about on other, on other shows. I'm thank glad, you I'm so glad. much. And um, continue your journey. There is much to learn. I am of the opinion that with the last breath, we will still be learning. Yes, definitely. It's much to learn. And then on to the next life. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> right. You so do get a break in between. You, know? you, you do, do get, get a break. Li- you know, life between lives. There you go. Life so thank- between lives. Yeah. <laughs> All righty, guys. Once again, thanks for watching. Till next time, we're out. Peace. Boom. Peace.